Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to Jubilee Church. Uh, and uh, my name's Dave and I'm one of the leaders here. Uh, and just to say you're really welcome. Uh, and the first thing I just want to say is if you're new uh, to the church, then uh, you're most welcome. Uh, and uh, uh, can I just encourage you to get in touch with us, make contact with us. I mean, it's lovely to watch stuff on a video and, uh, and to see things, but actually uh, we'd love to get to know you. And so can I really encourage you to make contact uh, with us through um, our info at um, address, uh, which is on the Jubilee Church website. Uh, and so uh, that's my first uh, bit of info, really. Uh, uh, we've got a lot in store for you this morning. Uh, and so uh, the first thing I want to talk about is our um, Sammy the Shark competition. If you remember, we had a Sammy the Shark competition, which was launched a couple of weeks ago when um, a fish swallowed our hero Jonah um, in the story. And so what we decided to do was to offer this plush shark to anyone that could write a poem. I think a few of you have got a little bit, um, um, how shall I put it, put off by the idea of the word poem. So what I'd like to say is it could be a limerick, it could be a little rhyme, uh, it could be anything really, an amusing couple of lines or verses, uh, and the plan is that we will look at those, uh, and uh, Simon Bag is still on, on, on hand to judge it, uh, and then we will work out which the best is. Uh, and given the response, which hasn't been great, if one of you got in there and wrote just a couple of lines of rubbish, basically, you'd probably win the shark. I'll just say that for free. So just get in there. Just the terms and conditions, you do have to be under the age of 18. Uh, but of course, some of you might want to cheat and get your parents to help you write um, the verses. No, that's not allowed, says Tim. Sorry, you can't cheat and you can't get your parents to write the verses. You have to write them all on your own. Okay. So there you go, uh, that is Sammy the Shark. He is ready and waiting to swim his way to your front door uh, in the next couple of weeks. Okay, that's the first thing I want to say. Uh, the second thing I want to say is um, uh, I want to talk about the craft, which is really, really exciting this week. I always love the craft. Uh, we have uh, uh, a little worm, here he is. Okay, and he is beautifully made of uh, an orange pipe cleaner with a bit of card and a lovely little face and little eyes as well. There's no expense fed on the materials. Uh, and you get to make this wonderful worm, which you'll find about why you get to make a worm later on in the preach. Uh, and, uh, and you also get to make a wonderful green leaf, uh, which I think you can probably cut out. And then what you can do is you could cut a little hole where the worm has eaten a bit of the green leaf. That'd be very exciting. Uh, so uh, there we go, one worm, one leaf, and an activity pack, which is absolutely packed with stuff, actually. So your activity pack includes a word search, it includes um, a spot the difference, uh, and it includes the story uh, in the little booklet. So uh, can I really encourage you to get hold of these? Apparently these are going out all over Shepparton. Uh, and we've what families that are not part of the church receiving these packs. They are so good. So can I just actually recommend, actually, if you've got someone that you know that would benefit from receiving one of these packs, why don't you sort of invite them to, to have a pack, basically, and I'm sure we can work out how to deliver um, packs to your friends and neighbours. And then they too can get a good knowledge of the Bible and uh, the story of God's plan for mankind. So uh, that's my um, second notice. Um, I think the next thing I want to do is I want to introduce the youth video. Uh, if you remember, the last one was absolutely outstanding. It was at the highlight of last Sunday, I thought, and it was brilliant. Uh, and um, by all accounts, the one coming up, I've not seen the final edit, but uh, by all accounts, the one coming up um, this Sunday is going to be even more brilliant. Uh, and the last one that was so good, just the special effects and the, 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 the boat and tipping over in the water and do you mean all of that was just excellent and, and uh, made Titanic look like a, a really amateur production, frankly. Uh, and um, uh, the next instalment is going to be even more exciting. I don't know about you, but whether you like, do you watch drama series where they get more and more exciting as they go on? Uh, Ruth and I are watching Poldark at the moment on, on Netflix and it's very exciting and each episode gets more Well, this is exactly the same. So uh, what we're going to do is I'm just going to introduce you to the next thrilling instalment of um, Jonah the Movie Part 2.
Hi everyone, I'm Dougie Dug Dug and I am very excited to be presenting the very first Jubilee Kids Show! Woohoo! And it's not just me, because I'm joined today by someone who became an internet sensation after last week's brilliant Jonah video. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my amazing, wonderful co-host, Mr Tom Wells! Hi everyone! Now last week Tom, I was impressed not only by the acting ability of you and the other young people, but also by the fact that you took one for the team and dived in the river. How was that? Well I have to say, it was pretty cold. <laughs> I bet it was. Have you tried out yet? Just about. I also found these in my pocket afterwards. And this one. And this one. What a fishing nightmare. <laughs> It sounds like it, although I'm not totally sure they're real, Tom. Yeah, well spotted, Dougie Dug Dug. I'm kind of glad a real one didn't end up in my pocket, though, because that would have been pretty gross. <laughs> yes, that would have been. Now, tell everyone what we've got coming up on the show today, Tom. Well, we have part two of the Jonah story with some incredible acting from the young people at Jubilee. Will Sarah get soaked again? <laughs> No, I think she got soaked enough last week. Very true. Plus, we've got a song for everybody to join in with. And I think you're going to say a little bit about how the choices we make each day are very important. I am indeed. And now, this is very exciting, drum roll please, it's time for part two of Jonah. Yep, it certainly is. Roll the clip. pick up the story today with Jonah lost in the sea. The storm has stopped and he is all alone sinking under the waves. But God has a plan to rescue him. Sammy, my big fish friend, swallow the man that has been thrown into the sea. Oh, it stinks in here. What is that smell? And what is all this slimy stuff? all over me. What was that? Something just touched my foot. Jonah was in a dark and smelly belly of the fish for three days and three nights. He was very scared and he shouted to God for help and prayed. God, I'm gonna die. Please save me. You threw me into the sea. I went down, down into the deep Seaweed was all over my head. Now I'm trapped forever. Please save me. I should have gone to Nineveh as you asked. God heard Jonah's prayers and spoke to the fish and the fish spat Jonah out onto dry land. God then spoke to Jonah again. Jonah, get up and go to Nineveh and tell them what I say to you. This time, Jonah did what God had told him and spent three days walking around the whole of Nineveh and told the people what God had said. 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed! When the king of Nineveh heard this, he was very scared and very sad and sent a message to everyone in Nineveh. <gasps> the 
The people of Nineveh will be destroyed in 30, 40 days. Summon the people. People of Nineveh, you and your animals must not eat or drink anything. You must take off your nice clothes and put on scratchy cloth. You must stop doing evil things and pray that God will forgive us and stop being angry with us. God of the Hebrews, we have heard that you will destroy us for the terrible things that we do. I'm so sorry for all the horrible things I have done. I promise I won't be bad anymore. Please don't destroy my city. God of the Hebrews, I am hungry and thirsty and my clothes are itchy. I feel so weak. You are so foul, powerful and could destroy us, but please be kind to us. God saw what the people in Nineveh did, and they stopped doing bad things. So God did not destroy them. This made Jonah very angry. I knew this was going to happen. That's why I ran away to Tarshish. God, I knew that you would be kind and loving to them. I knew that you would forgive them and not punish them. They don't deserve your love. Jonah, do you think you are right to be angry? Jonah was so angry that he left Nineveh and sat on a hill to see what God would do. It was very hot and the sun was high in the sky. God made a leafy plant grow up to provide some shade for Jonah. Oh, that's much better. <laughs> but the next morning, God sent a worm to eat the plant and it was destroyed. Why did the plant die so quickly? It would be better for me to die than to live. Jonah, you are sad and angry that I destroyed this plant even though you did not look after it or make it grow, but I did. Should I then not have saved the many people of Nineveh that I love and who did not know that what they did was bad? Oh, that was so cool. I really enjoyed that. Well done, everyone. It was brilliant. And Dave, that week, I think that should become a permanent fixture. See what Ruth thinks about that. And the worm? Well, I've never seen a worm quite like that, but I thought it was brilliant. It was all brilliant. And Tom, that sheep really caught you by surprise, didn't it? Yeah! It gave me the fright of my life. I'd say never work with kids and animals. Very true. Everyone done such a brilliant job. Well done, Team Jubilee. So, what did you want to say about choices, Dougie Dug Dug? Well, it's just that Jonah had a choice to make when God asked him to visit Nineveh. And rather than doing what God asked him to do, Jonah chose to do the complete opposite. That was pretty stupid, because he ended up in the big fish's stomach, which must have been truly gross. And even more gross was that he only got out of the fish's stomach by that big fish throwing him up. <coughs> Tom? <coughs> Tom? <coughs> what are you doing? Are you alright? I'm being a sound effects department for the fish throwing up. Nice. Good job, sir. Well, going back to Jonah, Jonah would have done much better to have just done what God asked him to do in the first place. Jonah had a big choice to make and he got it wrong. But the truth is this, we all have little choices to make every day. What kind of choices are you thinking about, Dougie Dug Dug? Well, say someone calls you a horrible name at school. Which totally happens. Yes, true. And sometimes everything inside of you wants to call that person a horrible name back. Very true. Well, a good choice would be not to call that person a horrible name back. Because if you do, that's when things can get really ugly. And I think you're going to demonstrate that for us now, Tom, aren't you? Oh, Tom, you're actually such a loser. Oi, be quiet, dog breath. Don't call me that. Who are you shoving? That's it.
<laughs> that was brilliant. Well acted out, you two. Thanks. Um, and exactly how much shaving foam have you got up your nose now, Tom? Quite a lot. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Um, it should come out, though, eventually. Good news. So you can see how things can get totally out of hand in a situation like that, boys and girls. But actually, if Tom hadn't called his sister a nasty name back in the first place, then there wouldn't have been a fight. It's really not easy to make a choice like that, especially when everything inside us wants to get back at the person being horrible to us. But it's the right choice to make. Very true, Dougie Dug Dug. So what you're saying is that we all have lots of little choices to make every day. We do. So boys and girls, can I encourage you to make good choices every day? And you know, sometimes we get that right, sometimes we get it wrong. If you get it wrong, say sorry to God, he'll forgive you and give you a new start. But try and be someone making good choices. The other thing I wanted to say really quickly was this. Jonah was angry with God. He was cross with God. You know what? It's okay to be angry with God. He's big enough to cope with all of that. Actually, what God wants is us to be real and honest with him. So tell God how you feel. I think it's time for a song. It is. This is a song of mine called Tidal Wave, which fits with our watery theme. And some of you have sent videos of you guys joining in. Yeah, you all did a great job. Well done. Do join in at home, everyone, and we'll see you again on the Jubilee, Jubilee Kids, Kids Show. Show. Bye. Bye. You painted colours in the sky, made the clouds a tower high. We worship, we worship you. You scatter stars with holy hands, dust of rock with golden sands. We worship, we worship you. It's a beautiful world out there. Simply us and beyond compare It's a beautiful world out there And it's made by you We bow down Humble by the world you made King of God and King of Grace Our voices in wonder and louder Song of Johnny We worship, we worship It's a beautiful world out there Simply us and beyond come It's a beautiful world out there And it's made by you Humble by the world you made, King of love, King of grace. Our voices in wonder and louder than thunder roar. You completely take our breath away. Our simple prayer is this each day. We long for your love, Lord, to be like a Is it wonder and louder and 
and that was absolutely brilliant. I don't know whether you noticed, but I even had a little cameo role uh, in, in that production. You may be able to spot me uh, um, as one of the um, supporting cast. Uh, and uh, please write in with your comments and your, your, your critical review of the film. Uh, but uh, it was really, I really enjoyed um, making my little section of it uh, and uh, everyone else enjoyed theirs as well. So uh, that is tremendous. Thanks so much to the whole team who have lovingly put that together. Editing, directing, script writing, uh, acting, uh, supporting, providing props, uh, you name it, uh, a lot has gone into that. Okay, um, on a slightly um, sadder note, uh, I just need to announce that um, a little bit belatedly, and sorry for that, uh, but um, Joan Lewis, who is a dear uh, part of our Jubilee Church family, uh, went to be with the Lord um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, I'd just like to say that I think that was actually quite a, a blessing. Uh, she was in a lot of pain. Uh, she had very swollen legs. They caused a huge agony. She was um, pretty much immobile. Uh, and um, and it, she found life very tough uh, towards the end. Uh, and, um, but, but throughout it all, and I just want to say this, throughout it all, she, she maintained a really good sense of humour, and she was still joking, and she was still laughing. I used to give a list to crowning years, uh, and back home again, and they used to take a really long time, and she was in agony for much of the time. But she still was able to crack a joke, and, and uh, we were able to laugh about stuff. And um, I would sort of commend that side of her to you, really. Uh, and uh, also another person that I want to commend it to you is um, Bobby, who uh, visited her every week uh, right up until she passed away uh, and faithfully would go around, would faithfully visit uh, and would um, faithfully make sure that she was all right. And uh, that sort of friendship, uh, can I just say, is hard to come by. Uh, and so um, I just want to commend Bobby to you uh, as a really good example of being a faithful friend uh, and committing yourself uh, to um, people in the church. And that is what the church is all about at the end of the day. It isn't about the leaders looking after the flock. It's about each of us looking out for each other. Uh, uh, the Bible talks about every supporting ligament, supporting one another in Ephesians. And I just want to remind us that it's really important that we continue to look out for each other and support each other uh, during this difficult time. Uh, um, a slight advance notice, uh, we do have the funeral coming up. Uh, and it will be, so I'm quickly checking my diary, it will be on Thursday the 15th of October. Um, there will be a committal service at Woken Crematorium, which you probably won't be invited to because there's a maximum of 15 allowed. But then we will have a sort of uh, a mini service, probably here at the Jubilee Centre around 5 o'clock on Thursday the 15th. So um, if you knew Joan, can I encourage you to put that in, her, uh, in your diary and uh, we will then make contact with you and, and try and get up to 30 guests uh, um, uh, suitably socially distanced and registered along here at the Jubilee Centre on that Thursday, where we'll be running um, a, a celebration service for the life of Joan, and we'll be remembering uh, um, all the aspects of her life and how she was an important part of this church. So that was a slightly sadder announcement, uh, and uh, now we're into the final leg of the introduction uh, and uh, Tim is going to preach the final instalment of um, Jonah, uh, and uh, it, is, it is incredibly good stuff. That final chapter is full of challenge uh, and full of uh, provocation uh, for these times. Uh, and uh, so I'm just going to pray now for Tim as he comes and he shares God's word. Uh, and uh, will you do the same, actually? Will you just bow your heads uh, and let's pray for him together as he uh, comes and brings um, your word. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for Tim. We thank you for, uh, uh, Lord, uh, the gift that you've given him. And uh, Lord, I ask that you'd fill him with your Holy Spirit and that you would make him bold and decisive in his preaching and that he would challenge us and provoke us to love and good works uh, during the season of fear and uncertainty. Uh, Lord, I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Jubilee Church Shepparton. Today we're going to close our series all on Jonah. 
I also want to say thank you to the youth uh, for their, you know, their energy, their commitment. Emma and I love spending time with them on Thursday evenings. We love seeing their creativity, their enthusiasm. So youth, guys, we love you. Please carry on sh uh, showing this level of commitment because um, we're looking forward to what comes next from uh, what you've been doing so far. And we're going to uh, be looking at the final chapter of Jonah today. It's chapter 4. But before we do, I want to ask you this question. What are you like when you don't get your own way? How do you react? Do you complain and moan to everyone, anyone who will listen, who's in earshot? Do you dig your heels in? Do you have a sulk? Go all quiet? Sometimes, uh, for me, I'm described as maybe like a hedgehog where you kind of roll up and go all prickly. You know, how are you when you don't get your own way? Because we're going to see, as so excellently demonstrated by our young people, Jonah has a massive sulk. And if you've never experienced a sulk, if you've never ever experienced a sulk before, well, I found a wonderful article written uh, by The Guardian that might help us understand how to sulk. Sulking is emotional strike action. You still function as a human being, but you work to rule. You must never agree to anything. You must only ever acquiesce to things. When someone asks if they should put the kettle on, the correct answer is, if that's what you want to do. That's because the underlying message for all sulking is that deep hurt is being felt because the other person is utterly selfish. The big dilemma with sulking is whether you should slope off to another room and do it. Remember that out of sight is out of mind, and they might forget you're in a mountainous sulk. The best solution is to stay in the same room, but pretend other people are not there. Eye contact is a big no-no for sulkers for two reasons. Firstly, no eye contact is the clearest possible sign that a major sulk is underway, and secondly, if someone were to do anything funny or loving and you were to see it, you might inadvertently smile and the sulk would be irreparably damaged. It's a cast iron rule that once you've unsulked, you can't then resulk. It's like frozen food. Once you've defrosted, you can't then refrost. Sulks can last anywhere between seven minutes and seven years. Teenagers are in an almost perpetual sulk because they are in a continual state of being misunderstood. When people are in a sulk, they discover how much harder everyone else has to work to humor them. Some people enjoy this so much that they decide to become permanently grumpy. The sulk, like the trifle, is a peculiar British thing. That's because it's the form of emotional expression for people who don't know how to express themselves. The sulk says, I can't express myself, so I'm not going to express anything. And you'll just have to guess what I would have expressed had I been able to express what I wanted to express. The sulky then has to decide their response to the sulker. Ignoring the sulk is like ignoring the laundry basket. It'll keep building up until it's very unpleasant indeed. What's generally required to end the sulk is a mixture of complete attention physical reassurance, brief subjection to verbal sarcasm, and their major admission of guilt and selfishness. As the air clears, it's absolutely vital not to say, that was a big sulk, wasn't it? This is the quickest way possible of launching the world's largest, longest, and deepest sulk. So there you have it. If you've never had a sulk before, never experienced the raw end of a sulk, that is the guardian on how to sulk. And I don't know about you, but I just relate so much to that in terms of being on the raw end of engaging with someone in a sulk, whilst also recognizing myself in a lot of that. And we're going to explore this series, the looking at Jonah. Today we're going to look at Jonah chapter 4 and unpick the passage as we go. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn to Jonah chapter 4, find it on your app. We're going to be starting at verse 1 and going to look through 1 to 4 to start. So I'm going to pray 
before we begin. Lord, we thank you for this series. We thank you for the story of Jonah. Lord, would you help us right now to understand your message for us looking at this chapter? Lord, would you bring it to life for us? Would you encourage us as we go through it? Please, Lord, would you inspire these words that they might have life-changing impact in us. Amen. So, verse 1. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Have you ever felt that you had, you know, you had an issue with someone or over something and you're like, I've dealt with that. That doesn't impact me anymore. It doesn't bother me. It used to, but not anymore. I've worked my way through that. And then later, maybe, you know, days, months, years, a situation arises where you get thrown back into that same situation. And like a spring inside, the well of all those feelings start bubbling back to the surface. And you realize, ah, I haven't dealt with that yet. That's still work to do. Oh, I thought I was there. But I'm actually not. And that feeling runs deeper and it runs stronger than I thought. And the story of Jonah is in many ways as much about the redemption of Jonah's heart as it is about the redemption of the city of Nineveh from destruction. Jonah's journey has been really this tale of a reluctant messenger of God who has pretty much done everything in his power to not do what God asked him to do. He avoided going to Nineveh by going, getting on a ship. He ended up in the, the belly of a big fish. And, even in, and then at his lowest point, in this roundabout way, he says, I will make good on my promise and I will go to Nineveh. And we can be reading the story thinking, okay, you know, now we're cooking on gas. Jonah's heard the message. He's finally getting it. He's going to make his way to Nineveh. And we're, we're, we're gaining momentum. We're getting going on this story of what God's asked him to do. And then Jonah witnesses the first-hand miraculous power of God at work. He arrives, as we know, via ship, via fish, spat out onto land, walking across the land until he gets to Nineveh. And he delivers his message, 40 more days and Nineveh will be no more. And what we can think is, well, do the crowds of all these evil people rush to him? You know, do they rush to beat him up, to lock him up, or even to kill him? No, the most remarkable thing happens where everyone from royalty down to the poor, upper, lower, middle class, the rich, the poor, the young, the old, even the animals, but we're not sure how much say they had in terms of whether they got their dinner taken away from them. The whole city repents in this shortest sermon message. A city in excess of 120,000 people start calling out urgently for God to forgive them. And you would think that Jonah would be in awe. He would be amazed. Because I imagine if it was in our community, in our town of Shepparton or the surrounding areas, and someone said to you, I want you to preach, or God said to you, I want you to preach this message, you know, 14 more days and Shepparton will be no more. And then all of Shepparton, instead of, you know, lynching you and stringing you up, has a conviction of heart and responds to God and saying, Lord, we need you. We want, to, we want to turn away from our old ways and we want to love you and serve you. I'd be like, wow, Lord, of what you're doing. That's amazing that you're turning hearts from their own ways to yours. Hallelujah, Lord, incredible. And surely, surely the story ends there for Jonah. That he goes home to 
Israel with um, the kingdom of God advanced in the city of Nineveh. A light shining in the dark Assyrian empire. But not for Jonah. For Jonah, there is still more work to be done in his heart. And I imagine, and this is full creative license, that when the city starts to repent, in Jonah's mind, he's going round and seeing more and more people respond to this call and this message with many different attitudes. It's too late for that. It's too late, it's too late to ask for forgiveness. Sackcloth, sackcloth ain't going to save you now. There's no point putting that on. Don't worry about it. You know, he's our God, and he is faithful to his word, and he said destruction is coming. So, sorry everyone, destruction is on the way. You might as well eat, drink, and be merry, because in 39 days, this is happening. And you can imagine a change in him upon seeing more and more of the city repent as they cry out to God, thinking, no, 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 stop it. Stop, stop it. No, no, stop asking for forgiveness. Stop putting that sackcloth on. Why are you, why is everyone doing this? And you can imagine him turning his frustration to God, being like, no, 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 Lord, don't you dare forgive them. Don't you dare forgive them. Don't do it. And the problem is for Jonah is that at this point in the story, we start to see that his plan and God's plan start to diverge. Because up until now, Jonah has broadly been on board with what God's pla- with the plan. You know, he's thinking, I'm going to go to Nineveh eventually. Well, the chances of the Ninevites responding to this message is probably fairly low based on what he knows of them. And therefore, the, the chance of destruction is probably pretty high. And so Jonah, you can imagine, is starting to think about the pros and cons, weighing it up. And for Jonah, we, we have to acknowledge that he definitely wanted to see the destruction of Nineveh. He wanted to see the same fire and brimstone brought down upon this city as with the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so as Jonah's weighing up the pros and cons, you can imagine him thinking, well, the pros, well, you know, world superpower threat removed, um, hometown safer, well, that's a tick, uh, likely chance of head staying on shoulders, well, that's a positive, can't complain to that get to be the one to watch first-hand destruction. Well, get in. That's incredible, pay-per-view. Just tick, tick, tick. So many reasons for it to be a great plan. Cons, well, well are there? Are there any cons? Mm, perhaps a long walk home, back to Israel, back to my hometown. It's quite far to Nineveh. Maybe that's the only negative by being here. And so he's happy with the plan because it aligns to his personal agenda. And he's supportive. But God, he changes his mind. And Jonah kicks off royally. And he's not happy about this one bit. And Jonah is like this big kid, goes out of the city walls, arms folded, in a huff, picking up his ball and saying, I'm not playing anymore. This isn't on my terms and I don't want to be involved. And worse, Lord, if you've, if you've made me the saviour of the Ninevites, how can I live with myself? I'd rather die than be associated with saving them. How can I go back to my own people? You know, Jonah the patriot, oh, Jonah the sellout, Jonah the one who saves the Ninevites, brings repentance to them. What are they going to think of me? Lord, you've humiliated me. I've come all this way to preach a message of destruction, and then you go and save them? What am I, some muppet? Oh, Lord, just take away my life. Take away my life. Sometimes we can also be caught up with too much what we think people will think as to whether actually it's important what God thinks. And that's the priority What does God say? Not what does Dave say, what does Tim say? What's God saying to you? What's he calling you into? And so we pick up the story in verse 5. Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. 
Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. So outside the city walls, Jonah, he makes himself a shelter. He's like, I don't like what God is doing, but perhaps there's still time. Perhaps the Ninevites will screw it up and God will rechange his mind. I can watch the destruction from here, popcorn in hand, and watch the fireworks. Jonah looks upon this city, this, this repentant city, and hopes it fails. Have you ever looked at something you didn't agree with and hoped for failure? I know I can find sometimes those thoughts creeping into my head. You know, an idea of you know, having an idea at work and then a colleague coming up with a different idea and then thinking, everyone's like, oh, we love their idea. And you're there thinking, no, 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 what about my idea? I thought my idea was the best idea. And they're like, oh, this is a great idea, let's do this. And then you find yourself being like, well, I hope that crashes and burns. I hope that doesn't work out. I hope they come back to me and, you know, almost like that superstar and be like, oh, Tim, we should have listened to you. Yes, you should have listened to me. That's right, you should have listened to me. You should have gone with my idea. And you can find that as we just do that. You think, where are those thoughts coming from? It's not healthy. It's actually really ugly. And I cringe when I even think about it now, being like, well, how can you feel that way? How can you think about that, Tim? And we've got to really check our hearts and challenge ourselves to not get drawn into wanting to see other things fail. Because the issue here is that the character of God starts to come into conflict with Jonah's identity. And Jonah's identity is so wrapped up in his culture, he can't accept God at work. All he sees is betrayal. He wants judgment, condemnation, and destruction. Yet God is compassionate. When you learn to drive, you have to pass both your theory and your practical test. The theory is to ensure you have a good understanding of the rules of the road so that when you're on the road, you are keeping yourself safe as well as those on the road safe as well. And the practical is to ensure that you can actually drive a car or a van or a bike. You know, does your right hand and your left hand, do you have the coordination with your feet to do the pedals all at the same time and not cause an injury to someone? Jonah knows the theory of who God is, and in his anger, he quotes it back to God. You know, I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. But he's angry at the practical outworking of this understanding. You're, com you're a compassionate God, but you're not actually meant to be compassionate to them. You are slow to anger, but you're not meant to be slow to anger for them. You are abounding in love and forgiving of the wicked, the rebellious and the sinners, but you're not meant to do that for them. You're not meant to do them a favour, to show them love, care for them. That's just for us. Who is God to you? Do you maintain exclusivity of God over your own life? Oh, it's just my thing. I, I go to church, I believe. It's just, it's just for me. It doesn't matter. It's not, it's not, it's not for you. It's just, it's just for me. It's my thing. Because God is compassionate. And the whole book of Jonah is full of God's compassion at work flowing through every chapter. In chapter 1, we see that Jonah runs away and he boards a ship. And on that ship, we know there's a big storm that happens. And the sailors go, well, who are you? And he tells them who he is. He tells them who, he, uh, who his God is. And the sailors believe him. And the sailors turn to God and say, Lord, have mercy on us. And it says that they make vows to him. Even in Jonah's disobedience as he's running off, God is still faithful to the sailors that he encounters in that journey. 
And as Jonah is sinking into the abyss, into the ocean, as it's the first time where he sort of said, oh, I, I really don't want to do this, I'd rather die, throw me overboard. You know, God doesn't just let him drown. He shows him compassion by sending a big fish to get him. He chooses to save Jonah. And in chapter 3, he changes his mind over bringing destruction to this city. And he looks upon their repentant hearts and he stops. And in chapter 4, he doesn't abandon Jonah. He doesn't look at it and go, box ticked, ask Jonah to go and bring this message to Nineveh. Jonah's brought the message to Nineveh. Jonah's now really unhappy at what's happening He doesn't say, well, you know what, that doesn't matter. 120,000 people, one person, tough. He goes after the one, as he does time and time and time again. When Jonah's having a sulk, God doesn't just leave him there in his sulk. God meets him where he is. And Paul wrote in Philippians 1, verse 6, he wrote, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God isn't done with Jonah, even in his sulk. He wants to help him become the best of who he can become. And it's the same for us. God wants to help us become the best of who we can be. Even when we sulk, even when we get mad, we don't agree with God's plans in our lives, he still cares for you. And he still wants to help you mature through how you're feeling. And so God does some heart work with Jonah as he tries to get him to see the heart that he has for the lost. You know, the heart that breaks over wanting to see lives return to God. And they have this therapy session. And God doesn't get angry at Jonah and said he's a patient listener. And does Jonah have a right to be angry at God's compassion? You think, well, probably not really. You know, he's experienced enough of it himself, even on this journey, firsthand. And Jonah's quoting back to God, um, Exodus 34, in terms of him being slow to anger and abounding in love. And he would know in that story when God is about to just show his whole glory and and now the goodness of him flow before Moses, he would know just in the bit before that God says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. He just doesn't like it and he's still annoyed. So as God often does, as he tries to help us understand in our stubbornness, he tries a different way. And as we saw that wonderful craft earlier, he provides a a leafy plant to grow and spring over Jonah and provide him with shade. You know, what a result in that hot setting. And then God sends a worm uh, to eat the plant and cause it to wither and Jonah becomes sunbaked. Jonah would become probably a little bit like me if I've been spent too much time out in the sun, a bit salmon pink perhaps, with a little bit of a shiny nose. And God pokes the bear. He pokes Jonah where it hurts and it's sore and Jonah erupts all over again. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. Jonah shows more compassion over a plant than for an entire city. The, just how ridiculous that is. You know, and God hits the point home for him 
Jonah, you did absolutely nothing in relation to this plant except receive some shade from it. Yet you care more for this than for 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left. Jonah, you are way off. You're way off, Jonah. And humanity is made in the image of God. We are a reflection of him. And therefore we are his children. And we are all precious to him and he cares for us. Your story matters. How you feel matters. And we have to get on board with God's mission, even if it impacts on our preferences. The mission is clear. Go and make disciples and teach them. It's a dual purpose mission, outward looking and training development from new believers to mature believers. And we need to prepare for change and we need to get used to different. We need to get prepared for what God is calling us into, not what we've grown to expect God to work within. Well, this is how we do church, or this group has always been going on. Therefore, it must be God's desire. We must have to carry on keeping it going. You know, the Bible talks about there being a season for things, a season and a time for things. And sometimes we can become so fixated on ensuring the status quo remains, we miss what God can be calling us into. Jonah didn't want to go to a foreign nation. He wanted the status quo to remain the same, the exclusivity of God to remain for the people of Israel. And he missed what God was doing, and then he gets angry and frustrated by it because it's not part of his plan. Jonah should have been teaching this city of the God of the land and sea and how he describes that to the sailors as the one he serves. Not abandoning them in their time of repentance by sitting outside the city walls and having a sulk. And as we enter into this time, this extended period of restrictions, as we approach the winter months, which for many of us are more challenging, our communities desperately need the hope and love of God even more urgently. The light in the darkness to hold on to. But we need to be aware of the danger of us sitting outside our community walls with an attitude of, um, of apathy, of disinterest, of you know, lack of enthusiasm or concern for the lost in our community. You know, is the church today at risk of becoming more of a club and a place where the focus is more about what we receive and what we get out of it rather than what God is wanting to do? Well, I prefer this preacher, so I'll listen this week. Or I prefer this worship song, so I'm going to give it my all for this worship song. Or I'll only serve on that team. I prefer this. I like that. I want my church with marshmallows and sprinkles on top. Brothers and sisters, we need to put to death our own agendas, our own plans, and we need to go with God's plan. And we need to accept for this season anyway that the way we used to gather and engage in our faith has changed. We're all online, for one thing. You know, BC could refer to before COVID, and whilst we wait for AV after vaccine, it is important that we don't enter a period of sitting on our own frustration at what God, what's going on. God is still faithful. He is still more than able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. And whilst these times are uncertain, our God is certain. He is faithful yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And over this time, we have still seen prayers answered. We have still seen healing, still seen people put their faith in Jesus Hallelujah. Jesus came to set the captives free. And while Jonah sulked outside the city walls, angry at God, hoping the captives got burnt, the people in that city were repenting. They were turning from their evil ways. They were asking for forgiveness. And he should have been there to help guide them. If you're a believer in Jesus, then you bring the light of the world with you into dark places. And we must not hide the light that has been lit in us. By God's grace, we get to partner with him in seeing lives saved. And you and I have a part to play. But we won't play it by shutting down, 
by taking a season out, oh, I'm going to wait for, you know, going to wait for all of this to blow over. And then I'm going to get really passionate again. And I'm going to really get on fire for God again. We need the resilience to keep going because salvation only comes from the Lord. And we have never, ever been more connected to the generation as a society as we are now. And we can reach out to our friends, family, colleagues, neighbors in, in the most simplest of ways. Phone calls, videos, um, you know, social media, letters still, maybe not telegrams. But as we take a risk and we take an opportunity and we step out, tell them your story. Tell them how God has been faithful to you. Tell them how God has answered your prayers at this time. How he has shown you his love. Because if we look at the whole story of Jonah, we see time and time again how God has just showed his love to different people on that journey. And that's the testimony. That's all we need to do is just say, hey, do you know what? This is how God's answered the prayer for me. That's who I believe in. I believe in the God who loves me and cares for me. So please take the risk. Share what God has done in your life. Because God is faithful. He is mighty to save. And in faith, perhaps we too, like Jonah, will see a miraculous move of God in our communities as we follow in his calling, in his guiding, and in his direction. And I'd love to just encourage you to just take one moment by moment. Just take up, ask God just to give you opportunities to share of his faithfulness, of his goodness to you as discussions, in discussions as they come up. Don't think I need to, you know, go out and um, necessarily tell, well, maybe, but just take one moment by one moment by one moment. How can I bring God into this moment, into this situation? How can I just share of his goodness to me? Because he cares for the person in front of you. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much that you are a faithful God, that you are a loving God, that you are compassionate, that you are slow to anger and you are abounding in love. Lord, would you have mercy on our towns? Would you have compassion on our neighbors, on our families, on our friends, colleagues? Lord, we want to be used by you to bring the message of love, the message of Jesus to those around us. Lord, would you help us to have courage at this time? Lord, would you help us to get in the middle of our cities, get in the middle of our towns, in the middle of our communities and our friendship groups and be a light in dark places? Lord, we just want to honor you, we want to serve you. And Lord, we just want to put to death our own agendas, our own plans. And Lord, we want to say, Lord, where you call, we will go and we will follow. Lord, here we are. Send us. Amen. Great. Thank you so much for that, Tim. Uh, that was really um, outstanding. Uh, and I'll just encourage us to just think through the implications, especially of Tim's sort of conclusion, really. Uh, and uh, just the importance of remembering that God is at work outside of the church. In the same way that God was at work in Nineveh, um, uh, he's at work outside of this church, uh, would you believe it? Uh, and he is moving. Uh, and uh, recently we had a family come to us and one member of the family has just become a Christian. Uh, or we had someone from the local authority come to us and, and ask for our help and, and, uh, in terms of helping someone in the local community. Increasingly, the church is being asked to be involved in the um, outside world. Uh, and, um, and so the challenge for you and me is, are we just going to pursue our own agenda? Are we just going to do our own thing? Even are we just going to pursue our own spirituality uh, and our own, well, as long as I'm all right with God, then, you know, who cares about everyone else? 
Or are we going to get in step with the Holy Spirit and recognise his care and plan of salvation for the wider community? I don't think it is permissible for us just to be concerned about our own spirituality. And so that throws out a real challenge to you and to me. And um, uh, I hate to say it, but that challenge is going to continue (laughs) right through the series of Judges there'll be exactly the same dilemmas and there'll be exactly the same gauntlets being thrown out to us by God time and time again as we look through the judges and we see how they too are challenged by God to make a difference in their world. And can I just say it doesn't just fall to the leaders, it's not just uh, down to the Tims and the Mats and the uh, uh, Carnies and the, the, the Dave Webb Peplos of this world to make a difference. It is down to every single one of us. Every single one of us has a role. In fact, in next week's preach, we see how God purposes the lives of all sorts of people. Uh, and um, let me just really throw that out as a challenge to you. In what way is God going to use you to carry out his purposes this coming week? Lord Jesus, I pray that each of us will be wide open to your Holy Spirit using us for your will and not our own in the week to come. Uh, And uh, Lord, I ask this in your wonderful and precious name. Amen. Thank you so much to Tim. He actually got quite animated during that. Tim's usually quite a quiet chap, actually. He's usually fairly softly spoken. But you could see that he, even Tim, got a little bit worked up uh, in terms of... Now, if that can happen to Tim, then perhaps we should uh, be suitably challenged. Okay. Uh, finally, just a quick reminder that we have worship coming up. Please don't just uh, uh, go off and eat your Sunday lunch. Uh, but uh, let's get involved and let's worship a wonderful saviour. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. Um, Also we haven't broken bread I think for a while so uh, my hope is that next Sunday uh, we will be breaking bread together. So can I encourage you to have uh, all your bits and pieces together, your grape juice or your wine, uh, your bit of bread uh, and uh, we will be uh, celebrating Christ's sacrifice for us. It's about time we did that, we've not done that in a while. Okay God bless you uh, and uh, see you next time.